ni kaya bara bara ye no ute wa ka ta ute ure o ma ka ka re re ka ye wa ka re re wa ka ye te ure o tu o e mo u mo u ka ye mo u mo u ta o The Uruwera country, deep inland from the east coast of New Zealand's North Island, and isolated by bush-covered mountain ranges, is the home of the Tuhoe people. Here in their ancestral land, they were able to resist European civilization until well into this century. Tuhoe legend tells that their beginning was far back in time, when Hine Pokukurangi, the Mist Maiden, came to the lonely valleys of the Uruwera. She was from Rangiroa, the lofty heavens, and from Rangimomau, the distant sky. Through the forest she drifted like a lonely spirit until she met and fell in love with Uenuku. And she lured him to earth, where he became the mountain, the Maunga, in that age-old fastness of the Uruwera, she lived with Uenuku and bore him a son, Potiki, the great ancestor of the Nga Potiki tribe, the Tuhoe people, the children of the mist. <laughs> The Tuhoi children today are growing up between the traditions and customs which give their small tribe its identity and the pressures and demands of the modern world. Demands they'll have to come to terms with when they leave their kuhunga or nest for the towns and cities. Tuhoi not being a tribe as forward as the others, it's taken them a long, long time really to grasp those skills and tools of the European way of life and to adapt themselves into our modern society. Consequently, Tuha has been known to hold on to the traditional way of life of the Māori people. Just the same, Rua Tahuna, the largest settlement in the Uruweras, with a population of just over 400, now has many of the advantages of the welfare state. Family Benefit Day and the monthly old age pension day are opportunities for a social get-together for its families and above all, the old people. It'll be the pensioners that'll always be here, that would be the older people. I don't think they'll ever leave your town. And the younger generation, as far as employment goes, will go to the cities, but they'll always come back. Holiday times, they're always back. A hard, demanding game comes easily to men who hunt deer, work in the local sawmill, or fell and haul native timber from the surrounding forest. The logs, mostly rimu, are brought to the local mill in the Roatahuna Valley, which provides work for most of the men in the settlement. Milling in the Uruweda country is strictly controlled and limited to a few blocks of Maori land, surrounded by the Uruwera National Park. Wholesale felling would lead to disastrous erosion, and therefore the future for native timbers limited here. In terms of work, it's going to be fairly critical for Ruatahuna. I believe that the mill is uh, finishing off in about two years' time, and uh, after that, well, a lot of the people will have to leave. Progress must occur, I suppose. But it's very sad to see people leave from the district. 
farming, Ruatahuna's primary industry, can give employment to only a few men on a limited 5,000 acres of pastoral land hemmed in by the hills. Land with heavy rainfall and a short growing season. Uh, apart from the possibility of developing tourism and hunting, there's very little else for the people to do here. So they would have to rely heavily upon what's in the Ruatahuna area itself and the bush for their total income. Possum hunting has uh, been very good and uh, quite a lot of our people uh, spent their whole time possum hunting and it's uh, paying big rewards. I think the uh, the possum will always be there and uh, it's just a matter of the overseas markets uh, will remain uh, for at least half a dozen hunters. Uh, I would say that it will take ten hunters. The problem of land is less severe at Ruotoki, where the Uruwera country joins the coastal plain. Long roads divide European land confiscated from the Tuhoi people after the land wars from what remains Maori land today, inland towards the hills. If hopes of compensation for the land taken come to nothing, then what's left is at least rich, fertile country. Dairy farming's possible here, for there's good access to the coast and nearby towns. The Rotoki district, in fact, holds the hopes for much of the Tuhoi's economic future. At one of their largest meeting houses, a plan for establishing pine forests is discussed. The affairs of the future dealt with in the manner of the past. Ngai Tuhoe. Now, the purpose of this meeting is to finalize all the arrangements concerning the amalgamation of lands for afforestation. The Tuhue area under immediate consideration at this moment comprises about 25,000 acres. It has been decided to let the contract go to Caxton, a subsidiary of the Tasman Park and a paper mill. Uh, it has been written into the agreement with Caxton that when the project has been going for some time that Caxton would hand the project back to the people and the revenue will be coming back to the Tuhue people probably channeled through the Tuhue Trust Board. For Tuhue, the future is still strongly linked to the past and the marais and homes of the Urawera. I always feel that when I go back to Ruatahun, uh, well, I'm going home. This is how I feel. To me, this is where I belong. And uh, I think, you know, you hear people saying, well, home sweet home, well, that's home sweet home for me. Where's too high today? They're all over the country now. Well, some are climbing over the other side of the world. But that nest, still there. You know, the tribe themselves was made from here. Their kohama, their nest, you know, with Alba. With only a primary school in the district, the young people must leave to finish their education in a city or at boarding schools. As far as I'm concerned, it's a good thing that our children are going away to boarding schools because then they learn what other people are doing outside of Ruatahuna. We are very much aware of the importance of education for our children and so they must leave the district to go to these schools. 
Scotland, uh, of course, for most of them, that's the beginning of their migration. You know, as soon as they finish school, well, they get a job in some town, and uh, the only time that we see them is school holidays or Christmas holidays. Before, you see, the land was the thing. But of course, uh, the areas of land now have been reduced and the population getting larger, well, they have to get out into something else. And more and more each year, only the old and the very young are left in the villages of the homeland. It's very important. I mean, this is when we show our sorrow in all our feelings, both to the one that has died and to the close relatives. And this is a way of expressing feelings between the relatives. And this is part of Māori tanga. It's a comforting thought, really, for a lot of Māoris as far as the tangi is concerned to know there is life hereafter, that they are not going to be left alone when they leave this world. You hear our people saying you are going to the land afar, you are going to meet your folks, and they mention those who have passed away in recent days or in recent months. And to us, this is one of the important uh, parts of the tangi in our way of life. As a child, I was exposed to death at a very early age. I am confronted with the reality of death in the institution of a tangi. The tangi is a focal point of Maori tradition, where ancestors are honored and elders deeply respected. It brings the people together, and it's a reminder to them of who they are and who their forebears are. The history of the Tuhoi people is told in the unique paintings and carvings of their great meeting house at Matatua, near Ruatahuna. They tell of old battles and of the struggle to survive in the inhospitable forest. Carvings record the long story of the Tuhoi and their links with other tribes. And the centre post bears witness to the Ringatu religion. Tekoti, an escaped rebel, took the traditional faith of the people and combined it with the teaching of Christian missionaries to establish his new faith in the Uruweras. It was in this rugged country that Tekoti sought refuge from the government forces who unsuccessfully tried to starve the Tuhoi into surrendering him near the end of the land wars of the 1860s. His church remains the very foundation of Tuhoi culture. Te Koti gave a religious meaning to a way of life needed at a particular time. He delivered the tribe from the land grasping of the European. He said, hold on to what you got. Stand up to the park house. So when we say Te Koti is a rebel, to us he's not to the people of Tuhoi. To us, he is a savior, a messiah for us. And we are known to be the stronghold of the Ringatu faith, the courtish faith. The Pākehā think he was a brave man, but he wasn't a brave man. What he had is a gift from God. That's all he works on. Never works on anything else but the gift from God to him. The same gift, I think, was given by the God Moses. 
Near the precipitous bluff of the Tuhoe's legendary mountain is the Monga Pohatu Valley, the most remote of all their settlements. A modern farm, hampered by its isolation, gives employment to two or three people, where once there lived a community of more than a thousand, led by the prophet Rua. Rua, who believed himself divine, was a disciple of Takoti and a born leader. And although in the early 1900s, Mongopohatu was a long journey from the nearest road, it was still a highly organized and thriving community. The people look upon him as history. You know, somebody to look up to, like a hero, I suppose you could call it. Even my grandfather, he always used to talk about Rua as a great man. But not everybody felt the same. And in 1916, a force of 60 armed constabulary and men tramped into the Uruweras to arrest him on a trumped-up charge of breaking the liquor laws. For the government, preoccupied with the struggle against Germany, was annoyed at Ruhr's refusal to allow his followers to enlist for the war. The police had come in heavily armed and made the mistake of arresting Ruhr out of hand without any attempt to engage in the formal explanation he would have expected. The people of Mangopohatu sold most of their stock to pay the expenses of his trial, and the settlement was virtually dead by the time Rua was released in 1917. Rua's old home stands derelict on a hillside near the settlement. For with the failure of his dream, he moved to his last home on the borders of the Uruwera country. His final venture was to establish a dairy farming community in this valley near the rich coastal plain. But after his death in 1937, the prospect of good wages began to draw men away from the land. And the most powerful and recent of these influences was the big mill at Kawarau. Tasman Pulp and Paper Company's mill at Kawarau has a workforce of 1,700, and of the large number of Maoris employed, many are Tuhoe. In this very different sort of world, even the younger generation are aware that their roots are still back home. You get homesick and I think that's what hits most of these people that come into the city. They find it's not as glamorous as they thought it was. They find it hard to get a job and when they do get a job it's something that doesn't suit them. You know it's closed in in a factory and you have to be there on time and everything you know. Often Maoris who've been brought up in town have lost their sense of identity of where they're from and what tribe they're from. And they need to know these things and feel they're not on their own. It's the only way that they can feel secure is by either going to a pub, going to a meeting place, and immediately they look around for each other. And when they see each other, it brings some ray of hope. Oh, here's one of us. Maoris and Pacific Islanders have tended to concentrate in certain parts of Auckland, the city with the largest Polynesian population in the world. While some parts are old and crowded, suburbs like Otara are comparatively spacious and pleasant. Most Tuhoe families live in this part of Auckland, some 300 kilometers north of the Uruwera country. Through the efforts of their leaders, they've found they can keep their identity as a tribe within a European type of society. New arrivals from the country are contacted and helped to feel at home by those already here. But not all Maoris are so fortunate. We have a Maori proverb significant to the young Maori 
living in cities away from his tribal marais. And the proverb is, if you watch a cloud drifting by, from the edges you will see small pieces breaking away, and eventually they'll disappear into nothing. It means if you remain with the main body of the tribe, you won't lose your identity. But if you drift away, you are in danger of doing so. In an effort to help young Maoris and Polynesians in Auckland, a special force called J-Team has been set up. Each crew consisting of a social worker, a clergyman, and a special duties policeman. The first reaction of young people coming into the city is probably one of bewilderment. Maoris get homesick. They're very unsure. They're not used to the nightlife that's available. They are not used to the amount of people in quantity, but they learn very quick. And unfortunately, I believe they learn the wrong things first. In fact, we did a special survey just to see what was available for young people, and it was nil. So we went about discussing and finding ways and means to provide facilities. And the young people themselves are taking part right from the beginning the result being that these young people now know where they can have their fun. And I think this is really the basis of the whole situation, is providing them with something, but getting them to do their own thing. If you're wanting something new, and you don't know just what to do, take a walk on the wild side with me. J-Team's done much to win the confidence of teenage islanders and Maoris in Auckland. Tuhoi's problems till now have been less pressing because their small tribe is so close-knit. Wide encouragement and education is given by Tuhoi leaders. At Auckland University, Jimmy Milroy, married with five children, is being wholly supported by the Tuhoi tribe's trust board while working towards a law degree. Other Tuhoi students are receiving grants as well from the Tuhoi Trust, which not only manages the major finances of the tribe, but steers its policies with a clear understanding of the traditional values of the people. I've always felt that I've had a responsibility to the Tuhoi. A lot of them are still speaking Maori, and I think it's easier to discuss matters in their own language than to try and explain it in English. Two way people, to my way of thinking, are only just beginning to find out all the complexities of this modern world. And I think things are happening so quickly, both economically and technologically, that um, there is a definite need for trained Maori personnel, and I think particularly from their own area, to be involved in assisting them meet all these problems they can come up against. The Tuhoi still hold to many of the practices which are part of the tribe's heritage and have largely been able to do so because most of them have only recently moved to the cities. Whether in Wellington or Auckland, Meetings are held the way these things have always been done, with a desire to keep their customs alive. The fulfillment of this marae in Auckland, the Tidahoe, is an achievement for the people of Tuhoe. It has established their identity in Auckland. It is a reminder for them when they see and hear their elders speak on the marae in Auckland here that they have their own meeting house, that they have their own land, and it is a meeting place for their people. 
Although Tu Hoi are finding answers to the problems of living in the city, they still feel the need to return each year to one of the homeland marais for renewal of their Maori tanga. The Tu Hoi festival, on this occasion at Ruatoki, has been held for several years. From many parts of the North Island, from Ruatahuna, Kawarau, Rotorua, Wellington and Auckland, they've come to join together on the marae and compete with one another in sport, in songs and hakas, in traditional crafts and in debate. <laughs> I think the festival, it's a great thing because of the feeling between the people, between the young and the old. And it helps teach the, the younger generation the traditions of the two way. And the younger generation also can teach the older generation of what is going on in the outside world. The subject of the debate by the young people is whether or not the younger Tuhoi should manage the affairs of the tribe. It's not just the sporting side of it that draws the young generation, it's the cultural side. The festival itself is held to see if you still got that bit of Māori tanga in you to come out and do the haka or to stand up and do a waiata. All this part that makes you a Māori anyway, in our way of thinking. And you get get them mingling with themselves and they tie that sort of friendship that is keeping the tribe together, which is very essential as far as the two people are concerned. We call it uh, he mate mate ao, you know, kinship. <laughs> As in the debate, the competing teams are judged on their efforts. back home. That's how it used to be in our young days, you know, the sports and the fun and everybody mingling together, eating together. It was something we really enjoyed and it was like uh, one family, you know, meeting one another for so many years and uh, it was just great. Your whole heritage is related to the land of your birth. They say this is where your forebears used to talk, and this is where they spilt blood, and this is where they raised dust. You can travel the whole world if you like, but you've got your heritage back here. You've got your legends, you've got your mountains, you've got your rivers, and it's your land. It's your land.